All right, let's take a look at lesson two five. Specifically, before we get going on two five, let's review the bell ringer, uh, which most of this came from lesson two four. Uh, so for lesson two five, here we go. Let's list all possible rational zeros. And if you remember, we had a theorem for this from lesson two four. And we talked about, you use two terms in particular to find all the possible rational zeros, that they can only occur at certain locations. Now, what was that, uh, what two terms do we choose out of this long equation to find all possible rational zeros? Who remembers? Very good. Yeah, you use the very last term. Whoops. Let me try this again. Negative 15 and the very first coefficient on the, the coefficient of the leading term. And so what we do is we take the factors of the last term and divide those by the factors of the first term. So uh, the last term, as we have said, is negative 15. As Alejandro said, the first term would be 2. And so what are the factors of 15? What numbers can multiply to give you negative 15? Well, I know one times negative 15 and negative one times positive 15 will work. So there's one and 15. What other numbers are there? Three and five. Good. So I'm gonna write these out in numerical order. So I have one, three, five and 15. And then what about, what are the factors of two? Oops. Just plus or minus one and plus or minus two. So if I were going to write out the all possible rational zeros, it would just be you divide out this list. And so there's four terms on top. There's two on bottom. This list is going to have eight uh, items going across, unless some of them reduce, but I don't think any of them hardly do. Let's see. One divided by one is one. So we have plus or minus one, plus or minus three, plus or minus five going across. Everything divided by one is itself. So I just have the top list going across. But then I have each item, each factor over two as well. So I'd have plus or minus one half, plus or minus three halves, plus or minus five halves, and plus or minus 15 halves. Now what this meant is these are the only locations, this equation or any equation really, that starts with a leading coefficient of two and ends with the y-intercept to negative 15 could ever cross the x-intercept. No matter how you change your equation, no matter what powers you made these, as long as this is the leading term and this is the y-intercept, these are the only places uh, that are rational that the, could, the graph could cross the x-axis. And so I already had this one graphed. You can see that on this particular graph, it does cross a negative half and positive three. I could zoom out to see if there's any more, but I don't see any more zeros on this one. So negative half and positive three are the real zeros and they're rational as well, because that's negative one half. That's a ratio or a fraction. So they are both real, they're both uh, rational. Since this graph only shows two real zeros and the power is four, how many imaginary zeros would this problem have? We have four total zeros. It has two real and two imaginary. That's right. This would be a real, and it's also rational, a real rational zero. So it doesn't have to be rational to be real, but real just means you can literally see it. Rational means you could write it as a ratio or as a fraction. This is also a real rational, which means we would have, that's how you spell it, rational. Let me try that again. There we go we would have two imaginary zeros. And like we talked about last class, imaginary zeros always come in pairs. So that would be uh, just extra information for number one. Okay, now let's check out number two. Let's do this all over again. So if, I, if we were gonna do number two, list all possible rational zeros. My last term in this problem, let me change color here so it stands out from the previous problem. What's the last term on this problem? The negative eight. All right, and so we'd be looking at factors of negative eight over the factors of the first, which what is the first coefficient? One. 
one, good, it's not a zero, it's a one. So you'd say factors of negative eight divided by factors of one. And so we would have, uh, I got one and eight and two and four. Are there any others I've forgotten? Or is that all of them? I think that's all of them. And so this time, this list, we have four numbers on top, one on bottom. When you multiply four times one is four. So I should only have four terms. Well, plus and minus four terms. So one divided by one is one. Two divided by one is two. Four divided by one is four. And eight divided by one is eight. So this would be all the possible rational places. So even you could change this power to a six. As long as this is the highest power, it doesn't matter, frankly, what's in the middle or what the power is. The only possible place is this graph. If it could have a y-axis or y-intercept to negative eight and a leading coefficient of a one could ever hit the x-axis, that's a rational value would be one, two, four, or eight. That's the only possible ones. And so if I looked at this graph, Oops. We'll see this one hits a negative one and two. So tell me, are those real or imaginary if you can see them on the graph? Are they real or imaginary? If you can see it on the graph, does it make it real or yeah. imaginary? They're real. So we have two real. Since I have two real and I could zoom out. Well, my thing's frozen because I wrote on the screen. But if there's two real, but needs to be a four, total of four, how many are imaginary? Two. Two, very good. So we'll have two imaginary, two real, that makes a total of four. And then these are both rational numbers. So these are real and they are rational. So again, real just means you can see it. Rational means you could write it as a fraction if you wanted to. We could say that's two over one. We could say that's four over two. You could write that a lot as ratios or as a uh, fraction, if you will. So that's why we call it real and rational. And finally, the last one. Uh, on the last one, it says write a polynomial function of least degree with real coefficients. And I marked out in standard form. I don't want us to spend the time going to standard form. That has two, negative five, and three plus i is zero. So here's the thing you got to get across for zeros. Zeros, you would write in this form as x equals 2, x equals negative 5, and x equals 3 plus i. Now, but there's one thing I want you to know about imaginaries, really imaginaries and irrational zeros. For both imaginary, that's what the i stands for, and irrational zeros, they always come in pairs. Meaning if you have a 3 plus i, you will also have a 3 minus i. They always work in pairs. That's never going to change. So if I have a three plus I, I will have a three minus I. If I started with three minus I, you would also need to include three plus I. And so what this problem is getting at is to write a polynomial function. That's usually just kind of what we write it as F of X equals. And we need to write this. I'm going to write it in factored form because it'll go a lot quicker. I'm going to use factored form because I marked out standard form, meaning we don't have to follow that instruction. So in factored form, the zero X equals two comes from the parentheses. remember inside lies, this would come from the parentheses of X minus two. Because basically what you would be doing is moving the two to the other side of the uh, equal sign. So you'd have to subtract two. That's why it becomes X minus two. What would X equals negative five, that zero become as a factor? What would it become when you make inside lie? Positive five? Yeah, X plus five. Now I knew I was gonna run out of space here. And so I did a plus and a minus like this, but this is gonna be two separate parentheses. And so the way you would do it is again, inside lies. So instead of it being a positive three on this side, it's gonna become a negative three. So both parentheses are gonna have X minus three. One's going to take the positive i, the other factor is going to take the minus i. And so the plus i will lie and become a minus i. The minus i will lie and become a plus i. So either way, when you get to the end, you should have a minus i and a plus i. They're always opposite. This would be my answer here for number three. 
So that's the bell ringer. And so now that we've gone through all kinds of things with polynomial functions, uh, rational zeros, irrational zeros, which I don't have a bell ringer for, but that was where we use that quadratic formula. Here we have imaginary zeros. It's time that we started looking at what's called a rational function. So rational functions are functions, uh, here it is, that are like two polynomial div uh, functions dividing one another. So a rational function, I'll call it, um, I'll just call it f of x, because that's where we normally do it, is it's kind of like two functions dividing one another. So I'll call it like g of x being divided by h of x. That's the idea with rational. Rational means you have two polynomials dividing one another. So in this case, what I drew, g would be divided by h. So we're going to talk about all these terms, which I want to remind you, we have hit some of these. Uh, vertical asymptote is an infinite discontinuity. So just to tie together some vocabulary from chapter one, we already learned about a vertical asymptote. This is a infinite discontinuity. So we're going to learn about things like that today. We're going to tie things together, but it comes from this idea of rational functions.